Today I have 23 DIYs, dupes, and thrift ups for you to try in 2023. So let's get started with our first one, which is... It's an amazing command center with a little bit of a twist, but for this, we're gonna need to get powerful, use some power tools, and I'm gonna meet you outside. For today's projects, I am trying to use up things that I have on hand. So for our message center, we are going to be using a piece of faux brick. I thought it would look really cool to be on the back of our message center. So I cut this down to the dimensions that would work for our project. And I kind of did this by laying out all of the elements of the command center to a certain degree and just kind of trying to visualize how it would all be set up. Then I had some leftover wood trim that was a little bit too wide for what I wanted for the frame. So I ripped that down on my table saw as well. Then we're going to make a miter frame. We are taking I believe it ended up being about two inches wide and we cut it on a miter. So you just cut the edges at a 45 degree angle. So make sure that the side pieces match up and the top and bottom pieces match up. And then you'll have a perfectly square frame and nothing will be out of whack as long as those pieces are in alignment. And the way we finish off the frame is using a little bit of wood glue on each one of the seams, shooting some nails in from each direction, and then letting that dry. And it's actually pretty easy. It's a lot easier than you would think. Now we're gonna set that aside for just a second and move on to some of the other elements. Now we're gonna revisit the brick and we're gonna do a German schmear on it. So all you do for that is take some joint compound, kind of just put it on in a random pattern. Usually it's best to work on a 45 degree angle and normally I would use a wider putty knife than I used here, but I just, found that one easily and I just made do with it. And so I just use some fast dry spackle because it dries very quickly and just kind of push that into all of the joints and scraped it off. And then we set that aside to dry. The next element is, is I wanted to have a little place to put a little floral. And my original idea was cutting a circle and like setting the pot down into the circle. Well, <laughs> This idea did not work out for me this time around. It's just that the wood piece is a little bit too small. It was very difficult to navigate with a jigsaw. If I had the right tools, I could have probably made this happen with like a scroll saw or bandsaw. So instead, what I decided to do is kind of build like a little box for the little plant to sit down in and then I can easily switch it out. It doesn't have to be the same size pot and I can maybe even use it for pins if I didn't want to put the floral there. You could just put a whole bunch of pens and pencils in this box. It was very versatile. So that's what I ended up doing. And all the dimensions I'm not really giving because it's really gonna depend on what size and scale you end up making. But you just kind of lay everything out and see what works. And honestly, I didn't even measure these. I just kind of eyeballed everything on that. And I bought, uh, I built a simple box without a back. So I did a more sturdy bottom and then some thinner wood around the edges to build that out. Next up, I wanted to put in a letter holder. And so what I did for this is I cut down some, that same like one by three, I think is what I used, cut that down to the same width as our box below it. And then did some thinner side panels again and cut that down to size. And then I used some paint sticks for the front to kind of give it like a crate effect. And and then I ended up nailing that all together as well and no back again on that as well. The next element was a little pencil ledge or a chalk ledge. You know, it, it, this is just a little ledge that we could put the marker for the whiteboard or chalk for the chalkboard and maybe a pen or a pencil just to have handy. I just took, I think it was a one by two this time around and then a little bit of trim that was similar to the thickness of a paint stick, but it was just some scrap wood that I had around. I just 
gave it a little ledge on the front and called it a day. It was very simple for this part. Then while I was cutting everything down, I took a five by seven frame from the dollar 25 tree as my kids have coined it <laughs> or the dollar tree. It was these simple black frames and you'll see that we're going to be using those a lot in this project. But I also had a chalkboard from the dollar tree as well. And it was a little bit too big for this frame, but I wanted to use this frame to kind of frame out the chalkboard. So while I was cutting everything, I just cut that chalkboard down to fit in that frame. So with everything built and before we head inside to kind of finish things out a bit, the joint compound on my brick was dry. And so I went over that with a matte sealer, just sprayed it on really good and left that to dry. And the reason I did that is it will kind of seal all of our joint compound and richen up that brick. And, and I just think it's really good to finish that off and not leave that unfinished, but that's kind of an optional step. Then we went inside and I painted out all of those wood build items in a matte black chalk paint. Um, I did the frame, I did all of the pieces in that black chalk paint and let that dry. Then I attached the frame with some E6000 glue, a very generous amount, but not so much that it squeezed out the edge. And then we're gonna let that dry, at, but I'm not finished with this step. We're gonna do a little bit more in a little bit, but for now we're gonna leave that be. And then I had this kind of bigger um, frame from the Dollar Tree, and it was kind of a square one. I think it's about 11 by 11. They, you know, you're gonna have to check your stores. Not everybody has the same thing. I, I bought a whole bunch of these a year or two ago, and they've been in a stash. It just so happened that it was pretty close to the size of this scrapbook paper that I picked up at Hobby Lobby on like a four for a dollar, I don't know, like a year ago. It was just a blank um, calendar sheet and I took out the glass in that, cut that scrapbook paper down to size and then I put everything back in the frame and then I took another one of our five by seven Dollar Tree frames, the same frame that we used for the chalkboard just a second ago and I took a piece of cork that I got from the Dollar Tree and cut out two pieces of that and kind of layered them on each other. Um, and then I used the backing of the five by seven frame and stacked that all in there. If I were to do it again, I'd almost try to squeeze another little bit of like foam core board or something in there to give it a little bit more push pin depth. <laughs> I think I could have layered that up a little bit better, um, but that's what I did for that one. And then I put that all together, obviously without the glass in that case as well. Now it's time to totally assemble our board. And this was super fun. So what I did is I took E6000 and applied it to the backs of everything and glued everything down. And then I left it overnight to dry. Now we're going to not leave it as is, even though it might be strong enough, if you were just gonna be using adhesive and nothing else, I would probably recommend something even stronger like a liquid nail or something like that. So the next morning after everything had dried, I went outside and from the back side, I kind of measured out where everything was, shot in a couple of finish nails just to make sure I was hitting it in the right spot, but also to add stability. And then I took some screws and went ahead and screwed in from the back side some longer screws into all of the bases of our wood pieces. That will add a little bit more strength and stability to our project without you know, messing up with the aesthetics of it. And then to kind of finish out the frame, I went from the back side and shot some nails from the back side in and making sure the nails are not gonna shoot all the way through the front. We wouldn't want that to happen. So make sure you're using the right length of nails. And this will just kind of make our piece a little bit more sturdy. And I have to tell you, I really love how this turned out. I think it's really interesting with the brick background. I used things that I had on hand, but nothing was like crazy expensive. You could easily switch out the brick backing to like a solid piece of wood, just working with what you've got. I used a lot of elements from the Dollar Tree and paint sticks and things that were not like overall crazy expensive if you were going out and purchasing it for the first time. And so just get creative. Maybe you can find scrap wood on your Facebook marketplace and get something really fun and really interesting. I love how this turned out. 
So for our next DIY, we are gonna be making a, like a small version of a blanket ladder, except for it's gonna be for tea towels. I saw this somewhere and I thought, well, that's a really cute idea. <laughs> so we're gonna make that now. And I had a couple of two by two lumber pieces left over, I don't know, maybe from my last blanket ladder, I'm not quite sure, but I had a couple of cut off pieces that would work perfectly for this. So I didn't have to buy it, but a two by two is relatively inexpensive. So with our side pieces, I cut them down to 18 inches and then I wanted it to lean easier and not be lifted up. And so what I decided to do was put a little angle on the bottom and I ended up cutting those bottom pieces at a 10 degree angle. And that's just so it would lean nicer up against the wall. Then I had some leftover wood dowels that were sent to me in a mystery box challenge. I think she sent me two packages and I only ended up using one. And so I had this package of three. I think it's from Walmart. They're pretty inexpensive. If not, you could just get some three quarter inch wood dowels. Now I left these the length that they were. If I were to do it again, I would have probably cut off three inches from these and made them nine inches long. So I'll just tell you that ahead of time, but I did leave my dowels as is. Then we needed to kind of mark where we wanted all of our rungs. And what I ended up doing is doing the top one at two inches on center from there. And then the next one was at eight inches. And then the next one was at 14 inches. So it started at two and then every six inches. And then there was four inches on that bottom rung. Now we're gonna use a wood boring bit. This is a three quarters inch bit. And we are gonna drill just barely in to create holes to countersink our wood down and it will just make it more sturdy this way. Now you could just like shoot some nails in from the side or screw some screws if that's what you have available. But I really think this is a really nice way to put these together and you just kind of drill down just a little bit so that you can have something to shove your dowel into. And so that's what we did is we used this wood boring bit. Then we took a little bit of wood glue and kind of squeezed it all together. We might have used a hammer to get them in so it was nice and snug, which is actually a good thing. And then we shot in a couple of longer finish nails through the side. And the reason I did that is just for a little bit more added stability. And then we left that to dry. And then later on, we took it inside and stained out the whole thing in an antiquing glaze and let that dry. And that was it for that project. Then you just hang your tea towels from it. I added a little boxwood wreath just to kind of give it a little bit of personality. I've leaned this up against my tile backsplash in my kitchen, but I think it would be really fun to have that next to a sink. If your sink has something to lean it against. I just think this is really cute and adds a nice piece of decor and interest into your kitchen. You could paint this out. I ended up, you know, doing kind of a stain treatment with a glaze, but there's a lot of possibilities on this and I just think it's so cute. And as an added bonus, it was free to me, <laughs> but even if you had to buy all the stuff, you could definitely do this for probably less than $10. We're gonna be building some small ottomans. We're gonna build four of them, but I'm probably only gonna build one of them today and put them together kind of like an ottoman. And we are gonna be building it using power tools and lumber. And we are gonna probably start on a table saw. If you don't have a table saw, don't worry because you can have these cuts probably cut at your local home improvement store, or you can use a circular saw, a jigsaw, whatever you've got on hand and make it work. So I have a half inch thick piece of plywood that's kind of a scrap piece for me. I'm making this seat first only because I think it will help us kind of assemble our frame. So we're gonna measure 16 inches. We're gonna make 16 inch square. We're gonna mark where we want it cut. And then we're gonna just move this out of the way while we set our table saw. So what we're gonna do is this just kind of unhooks here. And we're gonna just slide this out. This might be actually a little easier to do at the home improvement store because with my table saw, you don't wanna really go over about 12, 13 inches because that's what it's set up for. So I'm gonna actually make a mark so we keep it straight. I'm gonna have to eyeball it. I'm hoping that it comes out straight. So here we go. Safe is sexy, make sure you wear some goggles. The biggest thing you want to remember when you're working with 
any kind of saw is to keep your hands, limbs, and everything as far away from the blade as possible. Just be careful, take your time, no rush. We've got them cut down one way and now we're gonna cut them down into squares. We're looking for 16 inches by 16 inches. And now we have our four pieces for our four ottomans, but today again, we're only gonna make the one. Okay, so now it's time to do a leg. And I don't know if you've ever priced out legs, but legs for furniture can get really expensive. But if you've been watching my channel for a while now, you know I'm a huge fan of these deck spindles that I get at Lowe's. They come in various sizes from small, this is the medium size, and then there's a really big size, and I use them for a lot of things. They are such a good price this medium size here I get at my lows for three dollars and 18 cents now this is in the outdoor decking section if you're wondering where it is so we're gonna just cut this down on the miter saw to the right size miter saw not scary I promise you okay so to me this little area right here looks like the natural bottom of a like a table leg we're gonna just take our I'm just gonna pull this back so you can see we're not turning it on yet but we're gonna take this blade and kind of line it right up against the edge as close as we can so that they're all we want to make sure that they're all the same size there we go and we are gonna cut that off right there and then we'll chop off a little bit on the top end too and that's that's gonna be our leg and I think it's gonna work out really nicely. So let's start with a cut. Now hang on to this because honestly, that looks like a more modern looking legs. There's lots of uses for these. So I always keep those and we're gonna just go ahead and flip that around. So then we're gonna build like a little frame here. And so what we want to do here is make sure we have enough space for that to attach to. That's two and a half inches. It's a one by three, but they are never accurate. <laughs> we mark at two and a half inches. That's where we're gonna cut. And then once we have this cut, we can use this one as the pattern for all of them. There we have our leg for our stool. Perfect, right? It's just shy of 16 inches, so this is good. And all we're gonna do is use this as a pattern and make our marks on this and we'll cut them all. Here's a little trick. Write a P or some, make some kind of mark on top so you know this one's the pattern. Make sure everything is lined up and make our marks. Okay. And then we know that this is just right here on that edge. So we are gonna cut all of these. So these are all of our legs and this is our newly created scrap wood pile. My husband will be so thrilled. We've got a lot of noise going on. We've got some landscapers going next door. We're covered in sawdust. As you can see, the clouds have rolled in. I'm running out of time, but we have a few more cuts to make and that's for the side pieces. I am just simply gonna be using like a one by three. We are going to build like the side pieces of our stool. So this is kind of a rough view of what we are looking at. Okay, so what I think I'm gonna do here is just kind of line this up on the edges and then we're gonna make a mark here and a mark here. And then we're gonna just simply measure this distance here and that's what we're gonna cut. That looks like 12 and a half on the nose, so we're gonna cut all of our braces 12 and a half inches. 12 and a half inches. Now, I normally have a carpenter square, but I don't have it out here right now. So I'm simply gonna just take this, butt it up against that. There we have our cut mark. So this is the basic premise of what we're trying to do. And now we're gonna go assemble it. We're gonna just take one of our side pieces and we're gonna do this on the back side. This will be the outside front. Because of this is three quarters inch thick, you line this up with the edge flush. We're gonna line it up on edges of both sides because we're gonna do two pocket holes. This needs to be set to two inches on the backhand side. Drill in till this touches this. We have a pocket hole. 
Okay, so we're gonna just repeat this process on the other side. Now we are gonna attach it to our legs that we made. We want this to be kind of set back a little bit, like almost a quarter of an inch. I'm gonna set this kind of underneath because if we set this here, we can lift it up to the right height. So that's like a paint stick. It's probably about a quarter of an inch. Okay, so we're gonna line this all up. Then we're gonna take some special pocket hole screws, one and a quarter inch, and then we just stick it in and then drill it into place. Awesome, look at that, perfect. So we're gonna just do this all the way around and that actually makes for a very, very sturdy joint. So I'm really happy with it. Okay, so I wanted to show you a couple of quick little changes I made. The first one is that I am now adding a little bit of wood glue. I should have done that to begin with. I actually went in and unscrewed all of these other ones and that will just kind of tighten it up. And then the next change is that I switched out to a two inch screw. That will make it much sturdier. But tell me, do you wanna carry on plans don't grow without water and they cave when it's cold we could go till we're older but you're okay so we have a stool it's actually really really sturdy but to make it all the more sturdy we are going to attach this with screws what we are going to do is we are actually going to flip this over and then we are going to drill some pilot holes, two in each side. We're gonna just get that ready because then we need to upholster the cushion. I'm really excited about this. In order for them to go in just enough, we're gonna drill a pilot hole and then we're gonna drill another little bit larger hole so that it will countersink a little bit. So we've got these all drilled, pre-drilled, and then I've kind of taped this off as a marker of how deep we want, which is not very deep. And this is just so that the head will countersink down and go in a little bit further. And that's actually perfect. So then we can just put the screws in here. Take a little sandpaper. Any roughness we can just sand off. That's good, and we'll just do that all the way around. Okay, so now we're gonna do like a dry brushing technique that I've used on some candlesticks and several other items they have around my home. And we're gonna use some Waverly wax, antiquing wax, and then we're also gonna use some Waverly white chalk paint. And then I also have a damp paper towel to kind of blend if I need to. But the idea is to kind of give it like a old, kind of worn down wood look. So we are going to start with the antiquing glaze. And and you're gonna put some on and then kind of get it dry and then we're gonna hit it randomly and this is gonna put some age on it kind of get make it look a, I guess a little dirty a little less new and kind of make these two mismatched woods blend together I also have some matte mineral paint to add some gray if we feel like we need it and then after you have it kind of how you like it I go back with a very lightly damp like hardly any water on this paper towel and just kind of feather it out a touch just in case there's any like harsh areas and then we're gonna go in with some white chalk paint and then I'll 
kind of dab a lot of that off and we can come back and re apply even from the paper towel kind of very lightly oop I hit that too heavy so and come in and feather that out a little bit just very carefully and I try to go mostly with a grain of wood so I kind of go in and hit it all over while it, the paint's on it a little heavier but before it dries too much we're gonna go in and kind of wipe it down a little bit just to feather it out it kind of gives it like a little bit of a aged whitewashed effect and then you just keep layering this you can kind of go back and forth between the antiquing wax and the chalk paint until you're happy with the overall look. Once I was happy with the painted base for the ottoman, I went inside to create a padded seat cushion. To do this, I used some one inch foam that I already had on hand and I layered it so that it would be two inches thick. Obviously, I would just recommend you getting a two inch thick piece of foam, but I am an advocate for using what you have on hand. <laughs> and then I took some leftover batting and wrapped that around everything. Next, I stapled that all into place, but I didn't use very many staples. It was just kind of to tack it down into place. Then I took some of that same French blue velvety fabric that we used on the chairs in the dining room and I stapled that into place. And I typically do this similar to how you would wrap a present working in a north, south, east, west pattern and folding in the corners like a present. Now I do kind of try to cut away some of the excess fabric as I'm doing the corners just so that it's not too terribly bulky when I'm trying to staple it down. And then we are going to screw it down into place using those pre-drilled holes we created earlier. At first I felt like it was not grabbing the wood as well as I wanted it to. So I ended up clamping it together while I screwed it into place which really helped. Once it was attached, I added some beautiful nail head trim that you can buy in a roll. And that's it for this project. I absolutely love how it turned out. To buy a similar ottoman, you could easily expect to pay $75 or more. If you were going to try to build this version, it would run you about $30 a piece. Maybe a little less depending on if you have anything on hand like I did. What do you think of this? So for our next DIY, we are going to be building like a tray or a box with handles on it. And we are going to be using one of the scrap pieces of our seat. This is going to be the base of it. And then we are going to use some of the smaller size bindles. These ones are $1.98 right now at my Lowe's and we're gonna need two of those. Then I had this piece of one by six in my stash um, left over from another project. I hadn't used it yet. We are going to build the sides of the box with this. It's gonna be easy peasy. You could miter out the edges. I'm gonna just do straight cuts because I think it will look good and it's a little bit easier if you're doing a beginner project. What we are gonna do We'll do this kind of cheating method. Cheating, not cheating. So we will lay this up here. We are going to do the short sides first so that the front long side will be the attractive side. Line that up like so and make a mark where we need to cut it. And then we're just gonna cheat and we're gonna do the other side. Since we're building a box, we're gonna line that up nice and square trace and do another one and then what we need to do the length of this plus these on the end so it will cover up the edges and it will all work <laughs> Now you can see that we have the makings of a box like so, and then we'll just put it on the other side. Okay, so I'm gonna put these handles on the long side of the box. So we need to kind of center this on here, make sure that we've got a good length and we'll cut off the excess.
we want to be able to put our hand in right and be able to grab that handle so i'm improvising <laughs> i know that this is center and i like how this is curved and a little bit longer so i'm just kind of using that as a guide and then we'll cut the first one and use it as a template for the second one hopefully i get this right it probably won't be like super perfect but close enough okay that looks pretty good and then we'll just strap this down here and use our jigsaw to cut that out. I'll sand this down a bit, but essentially that's what it'll look like. So you can grab it like that. Awesome, I'm gonna love this. I am gonna show you just how quickly we can get this put together. We are going to use this 18 gauge brad nailer and I'm using one and a half inch nails. We're gonna use some wood glue. Okay, we'll run a bead there and we're doing the short sides first. Line that up on the edges and we are just gonna shoot some nails in. Okay. Perfect. Flip this over. Now we are going to attach the handles. Okay, so I want this to be very sturdy, so I'm actually gonna do some screws down into it, pre-drill some holes. cute is this? Just a little patching and then we're going to paint it up. It is going to be so cute. Do we love this or what? Once everything is assembled, I go back and patch all of the nail holes and the screw holes with some spackle and let that dry. Once it's dry, I sand it down so it's nice and smooth. Also, while I'm sanding, I kind of smooth out some of those rough corners and edges. And once we are done doing that, I take some Serenity Blue Chalk Paint and I spray a couple of coats of that on and let that fully dry. Finally, I go back in and sand a couple of areas just to distress it ever so slightly. I will be displaying this on my shelf in my living room and I just added an assortment of greenery, but this would be a fun little box to use in a lot of different applications. This was just built with some scrap wood from my pile and a couple of spindles all for less than $7, and I absolutely adore this box. Now, I debated about painting it blue or staining it instead. What do you think I should have done, stain or paint? Coming up in just a second, I'm gonna let you know what I have planned for 2023 and give those of you who are interested a health update. So stay tuned with me if you're interested in any of that, and of course, the DIYs. <laughs> I start by taking this three quarter inch piece of plywood from my scrap pile. I designed a free printable, which I will link in the description box below for your personal use, but it's designed using an old antique railing pattern and you can print it out on your home printer and then just tape them together. Then we just take some blue painter's tape and tape it to our plywood. Using graphite paper, we transfer the image onto the wood. Now it's time to take this piece outside. The first thing we're gonna do is we're going to want to clamp it to some kind of table, preferably one that you don't care too much about. 
just in case. Then you're gonna take a drill with a very large bit, large enough for a blade of a jigsaw to fit through. Then we're gonna drill several holes into the area that you plan to cut out and remove. Just give yourself several to start out with, and you may end up adding more as you go. Then we're gonna just cut, cut, cut away. You may need to back out and go in different directions, but all you're trying to do here is you're taking your saw and you're cutting along the dotted line, so to speak, to the best of your ability. Now you'll note that mine is definitely not perfect by any means. Just do the best you can and then the rest you can kind of sort out when it comes time to sand. So this entire cutting process took me maybe one hour for this project and I actually don't think that that's bad when you consider how intricate our pattern is. Isn't that cute? And we're gonna make it look a little bit better now by just sanding and we're gonna sand the front and the back. We're gonna sand some of these long edges and into some of the grooves the best we can with our hand sander. Now that we finished sanding this with our palm sander, I am borrowing my husband's Dremel and it has this little rotary sand bit here. And we're gonna go in some of those tighter spaces with this. Now you don't need one of these to do this project. You could definitely just use a sanding sponge and do it by hand. I just happen to have access to this and so I'm gonna give it a whirl to see if it maybe speeds up the process a little bit. We're gonna build the top and the bottom. So I measured this one by eight board to the same width as our scroll piece and cut it down. Now I'm just gonna warn you ahead of time that the one by eight ends up being too narrow and I end up switching it out for a one by 10 instead, which ends up being perfect. We are going to attach this to the top like that, but I think it would be a good idea to put on some wood glue. We're gonna Line that up. This is an 18 gauge brad nailer and we're gonna just shoot some finish nails in through the top and hopefully we don't miss. Just to add a little bit more security, I'm gonna add some of these L brackets. You won't really see these. I've got the top on it and now we're gonna work on the base. I'm making it two inches longer than the top to kind of give it a decorative element. Plus I'm gonna be reusing that smaller top to kind of add a little decorative edge and a little bit more weight. I attach it with wood glue, nails, and brackets, kind of in a similar way that we did with the top. But at this point, I decide to add three brackets and I also add a couple of extra pieces of wood so that I could shoot some nails in from the front side and add a little bit more stability. Now we're gonna beef up our top by adding some trim. I take some one by twos and miter them to wrap around the top. And I use some glue and finish nails to hold them into place. Now, as you can see me handling this table, you will notice that it is a little bit top heavy and it's easy to move around. So here's what I would do differently next time. If you want it to be more stable, I would suggest doubling the depth of the base so it was 20 inches deep that would slide underneath the sofa. I didn't end up changing this out at this time because once I slid it on my couch and did a dry fitting, it was super solid. But my sofa sits pretty low to the ground so the weight of the sofa kind of is holding it into place and making it sturdy. And this is why I'm such a huge fan of just getting up and just trying power tools. I've had no formal training and I'm just learning as I go. So this is something that I will know better for in the future. And it ended up working out this time around for me, but with each project, I learn new things and I just improve my skills. And that's how it will go for you as well. With our table built, it's time for the finishing touches. I take some plastic wood in a natural color and fill in all the nail holes and all of the cracks and I allow that to fully dry. Then I sand it down so it's nice and smooth. And cover up the top with some paper and painter's tape. And then I spray the whole base of it in a white spray paint in a matte finish. 
Once that's dry, I come back in and distress it because that's the look I'm going for to kind of match some of the other pieces in my area. And then I do a technique on the top, which I've done it on a couple of other pieces where I dry brush on some antiquing wax, and then I kind of blend that out with a, a little bit with a damp towel. And then I come back over the top of that and dry brush in some white chalk paint, and then kind of blend that out a little bit. And then I keep layering these back and forth until I'm happy with the overall look. Once it's all dry, I come back in and finish it out with some furniture wax and that's it. Can you believe that I built this from wood that was sitting in my scrap pile destined for the dump? I mean, I can't, I seriously can't and I'm so excited about it. If you were to recreate this, I put in a rough calculation of around maybe $40 if you have a couple of basic supplies on hand already. This piece blends in with my other pieces. It matches up with my dining table. It also matches up with another end table that I bought off of Overstock for nearly $200. While this piece is maybe not completely perfect in every way the end product is perfectly imperfect to me and I smile every time I look at it this deck spindle. I love deck spindles. I use them for a ton of things. I messed this one up for a project, but I think I can still do something with it. So we're not tossing it. Then I have this wood round. This one's I think 12 inches. I picked this up at Lowe's. I think it was like $7. We're going to be making a tiered tray and I'm going to use this one for the bottom one just because I already have it. But I have this plywood that was actually totally free and we're gonna make a one that's a little bit smaller now I will tell you unless you make some kind of jig or have like some kind of setup to make a perfectly round cutout with a jigsaw is gonna be next to impossible so we're gonna just do the best we can but it's not gonna matter too much because we're gonna do something around the edge so I think the perfect size for it is gonna be this cake pan so we're gonna use this as a template we're gonna trace it onto this plywood Cut it out to the best of our ability. Okay, that only took a couple of minutes. It's not perfect, but I think with some sanding, it can be really close. Now what we're gonna do is cut down the spindle on my miter saw so that we can do a little tear tray. So first we're gonna need to find center, and I'm gonna do this on the underside. Five and seven eighths, and then I'll do it the other direction. X marks the spot of our circle. So then we are going to pre-drill a hole. Then we want to pre-drill a hole in the center of this. Let's get the screw through. I'm gonna put a little dab of glue on this just to see if that might help. Let's hope we get this on straight. Look at that! So here's how you do a dowel screw. You put it inside here. I'm gonna make sure that's super on there tight. And see? And then we kind of repeat the process, marking center on each wood round, stacking it up and twisting it onto the screw dowel. Adding a little wood glue as we go, and on the top we add a decorative finial. Just so you have the dimensions of the tiered tray, the bottom round is 12 inches, the middle round is 9 inches, and the top round is a wood round that I got from Walmart for 97 cents and is 7 inches. To finish it off, I use this metal ribbon I picked up from Hobby Lobby for $3.99 as a way to trim out the tiered tray. On the bottom two rows, I nail it in with my brad nailer and the top layer is much thinner so I just end up gluing that on instead. I also add four wooden feet to the bottom just as a little extra decorative touch.
The last step is to just spray paint the entire thing in a white matte spray paint. Now, if we would have just used the scrap wood for all of these circles, this would have probably cost me around $7 total to make. Because I used some of the other items, it was a little bit more, but tiered trays can get expensive fast, and I think this one turned out really cute. But what do you think? Now my next DIY is going to be like a casserole tray. This tray is going to come in hopefully real handy and we're going to build it from scrap wood. All right, do I look like we've been building stuff or what? <laughs> and I've dug through my scraps and I've got perfect scraps to build this with, but mine happen to be the right dimensions, which are 10 and a half by 14 and a half. And I have these shorter scraps. We're gonna cut them down to fit the sides. This is gonna be fun to have. I'm really excited about this. So I am using one by fours for the sides and we are gonna cut down the short sides first and then we're gonna cut the long sides, just doing butt joints. Then we just attach using wood glue and finish nails. I'm using a nail gun because I love my nail guns, but you could definitely use this part with just a hammer and nails. Fill all the nail holes with a little lightweight spackling. I didn't want to have paint on the inside, so I just used antiquing wax for the inside of the box. Then I had this turquoise color paint that I got in the oops section for $1.25. I paint the exterior of the box in that. I put on these adorable handles that I get at Hobby Lobby. They're so cute and chunky and they run $3 each on sale. I screw them in by hand, but the wood is soft enough to be able to do this. Then I made a decorative label on my Cricut machine. Now, if you don't have a Cricut machine, then you could just tape this off with some painter's tape in the shape of a rectangle and then fill it in with this new chalkboard paint that I got at the Dollar Tree. Then I scuff up the edges a little bit, cover up the silver screws with a little bit of brown craft paint. And I thought I got this next part on camera, but I end up putting some felt circles on the bottom of this just in case I wanna use it on my dining table to prevent scratching. But how cute is this scrap wood casserole carrying tray? I think this would make a fantastic gift idea. Even if you were buying the supplies, it would be very affordable to put together. You could put whatever color on the exterior as you want. I have a feeling there are more of these in my future because they are just so darn cute. The first thing I set out to do is to build it. And boy, is that always a challenge. <laughs> it always takes way longer than you think. So I got that mostly built, but I was kind of up against a wire because we had a ton of rain coming and I wanted to add some scalloped edge trimming to it. Look how cute this trim is. I think it's gonna make an adorable kind of French filling addition to our Tarva dresser. So I'm really excited. We've got the measurements, let's make our cuts. I'm gonna make a cut here right in the center and then we will make sure that it's evened up on both sides. We beat the rain, let's go get this installed. So to attach our trim, I just took some scrap wood and nailed it to the underside of our dresser. That gave me something to nail it in on the front side to add this scallop trim. And I really feel like adding this scallop trim that I picked up at the Home Depot really gave it that French flair. And so that was such a good addition. Then I proceeded to finish building the drawers and all of that. It took so much time. Ah, oh, Ikea, why do you have to make it so difficult? I mean, it's not really difficult. It's just time consuming. If you follow the directions, you should be good, which is what I did for both the body and the dressers. And then with that built, I had bought some additional kind of um, pencil trim 
I'm not exactly sure what it's called, but it's pretty small trim and I use it a lot. So I probably should figure out what the name of it is. So to each side of the dresser, I wanted to add some picture box molding just to give it a little bit of interest to this kind of boring piece. And then I had originally planned to also kind of do some picture box molding on the front side, but because of another element that I'm gonna be adding in just a second, there just wasn't room. So I left it as is and then I took the molding that I had got for the front of it and covered up the seam where that scalloped trim met the dresser and it really gave it a pretty finished look. Now if you've noticed in this I am using these really cool miter shears which are essentially very, very sharp scissors that can cut through kind of smaller pieces of wood. I will link those in the description box below. But what's really cool about them is you can cut things on a miter, like a 45 degree angle, or you can cut them straight. And it makes it really handy. I don't need a saw for any of this, just these really awesome scissors. And then you'll see that I'm using a Brad Nailer nail gun power tools just always make things better. You don't have to use this. You can use a hammer and nails, but I'm telling you, one of my favorite all-time tools is a finish nailer or brad nailer because then you don't have to swing a hammer. It's super easy. <laughs> so with all of that additional molding added to our dresser, we putty all the nail holes and then we let that dry. And then of course we sand it down and then give it a good wipe down and then it's ready for paint. To prime it, I used some chalk paint that I had on hand. It works as a great primer. I also had some primer. It was just easier to grab my chalk paint. So you can use regular primer as well. And then I used some leftover trim paint that I have all throughout my house. And that's a semi-gloss in Sherwin-Williams extra white. And then I just painted that all over my dresser to give it a nice foundation. And kind of the piece de resistance is I found this French floral rub-on transfer and all you do is kind of lay it on the front of your dresser and take like a popsicle stick, it actually came with a piece of wood, and you very carefully rub it onto the front of your dresser. And anywhere that there is a drawer seam, you can take like a straight edge blade and kind of cut that down. And then you just rub it, rub it, rub it, and then peel it back as it rubs on. And then um, I always just kind of take my hand and go over the top just to make sure everything is securely in place. But what is so cool about this is then it looks like you've got this hand painted image on the front of your dresser and it's so pretty, right? I love this image. I got it off of Amazon. I'll link it in the description box below. They have a lot of different designs. I have a feeling I might use this technique again because it is so cool. So with that image on, then I wanted to add some crystal knobs because that is very French country, isn't it? <laughs> and so we drilled some holes for that and then added those beautiful knobs. Then we could have left it as is on the sides just with a white picture box molding. It looked really pretty, but I decided to go one step further and paint some pink stripes on the side. I just wanna seal the edges of your painter's tape with something. A lot of times I'll use the undercoat color. This time I just used some clear matte sealer that I use on chalk paint sometimes and it let it dry really quick. And then of course put on my pink chalk paint. I started off with like a, a brighter pink and then I toned it down with Folk Art Barely Pink chalk paint and I did some stripes on the side. And then of course, when you pull back the tape, it reveals perfectly straight lines, which is awesome. In the end, oh my word, this might be my favorite Ikea hack I've ever done. The transformation is from about as boring as you can get to something that is so pretty, so feminine. I don't really have a great place to display this. So for now, it's going in my craft room until I figure out a better plan. So I wasn't a huge fan of the base of this. I just felt like it was, it was black, but it had like some brushed on gold that looked like it had been hand done. So the first thing I did is kind of tape everything I could off, take it outside and spray it on a flat black spray paint, gave it a nice blank slate. So after that was dry, I came in and totally disassembled the top portion of the lamp, take off the harp, unscrew the nut, 
get everything kind of disassembled on that top portion. We even cut the like the light bulb section off with some wire cutters and just clip the cord. And I know that that is gonna seem scary and crazy to some of you. And I've actually never done this, but it turned out to be way easier than I thought. And then I reassembled it without the harp and all of that, the light fixture. And I kind of tried it on and it was still gonna be too tall. The little rod was gonna stick out too much and it was gonna not work for our official street lamp so what i did is re-disassembled took out that pipe that runs in the middle that holds the wire in it pulled it all out and i needed to cut out a one and a half inch section of that pipe i couldn't do it right off the top because i needed the threads for the nut to kind of hold everything all together. So my thought was, is I just got some pipe cutter. It's a little tool that I had in my arsenal that my husband uses and I use. And all you do is you attach it to the rod, kind of line it up with like a little blade and you tighten it and you keep spinning it around and around and around and around and around and tightening it a little bit at a time as it gets a little bit looser, you tighten it a little bit until ultimately the pipe cuts. And I had to do that twice to get out that one and a half inch section. And then to reattach it, I kind of cheated because I didn't want to go to the home improvement store and get a flange. I didn't want to get pipe fitting stuff and go to all of that trouble. That honestly is probably the proper way to do it or getting a new rod altogether. So I cheated <laughs> and I got a little Gorilla duct tape. I thought it would work out fine for what we were doing. Basically, I figured once we tightened up that nut, it would give it enough pressure that it would be okay. So I threaded the wire back through that rod, twisted it back into place, got it our nut back on the top, twisted it really tight and got it back to new. Make sure that the, th the wire is sticking out that rod and we don't want it to pull back down because you know, if you yank on that cord, there's nothing really holding it into place. So I found a tutorial by my good friend, Leah from CJ and Drill. We're real life friends. She's amazing and she is so full of knowledge. And she taught me how to do an underwriter's knot. I think that's what it's called. So I followed her tutorial of how to make that knot and I will link it in the description box below. And the idea of doing this knot is really important because that will prevent it if somebody like yanked on the cord, it won't like yank our wire back through that rod and cause us issues down the road. So doing that knot is really important. With that knot in place, we are now ready to hardwire a lamp post top to the top of our new floor lamp. You just match up the wires, twist them together. I'm not an electrician, so I don't want to give you too much tutorial on this. It did work out fantastically. You screw it together and then you take electrical tape and tape over the top of them. There was a ground wire that I also put a cap on and put some electrical tape around all of those, just securing them together. And then with it hardwired, you slip the top of that post cap right over the top of our floor lamp base. And it just so happened that it was the right thickness, the right size. It couldn't have been more perfect. I ordered this lamp post top off of Amazon for, I believe it was $39. And then all I did was tighten up the screws on the side of the post cap and that just kind of clenches it right into our floor lamp base. And then I took a candle light bulb, screwed that in, and then put on our top. Now, if you remember, we clipped off our light kit on the top, and that's usually how you turn a light like this on and off. And so you might be asking yourself, am I gonna have to unplug it and replug it in every time I wanna turn it on and off? And my solution for this, I have found these plug-ins that are remote control operated. I just plugged it into that, and you can just turn it on and off with a remote control. And so therefore, once it's plugged in, we don't have to worry about it. But Oh my word, this might be one of my favorite thrift flips of all time because it is so cool. It is a legit street lamp. Now it's not super tall, but it is a really cute size. I, I might take this outside. I may leave it right where it's at. I think it is so 
adorable and the base of it really lo looked like a street lamp and now the top matches the base the finishes matched up i'm thrilled to say the least of little repairs that we're gonna make. It's missing some moldings in a couple of places. I couldn't match it up exactly, but we're gonna do the best we can, and I honestly don't think you'll notice in the end. I popped off this piece from that side, and the reason I did that is because we're missing a piece on this side, and this is the dominant side, so we're gonna make sure all of those match. I'm gonna just hot glue this into place kind of on either side because I don't want it to be permanent in case we take this to another home someday and the, the dominant side is this, then I'll just kind of flip flop them if that makes sense. And then I don't know if you can notice right here, but there's a little piece of trim missing there and we are going to use some of that same molding and patch that up. So hopefully you can't tell um, once it's all painted up. It's that time. We're gonna start on the inside. Let's paint. brighter is this looking? I am loving it so far and it's just the primer. So while the primer is drying, we are going to be working on the shelves. As I mentioned that it didn't come with shelves, so I've got a little fix for you. I'm holding the DIY dolly because it involves an iron and she is terrified of iron. So if you hear her bark in the background, that is why. <laughs> so what we've got going here is I picked up <laughs> she really, really does not like irons. All right. So we've got some plywood that I had cut down at the home improvement store just to make it easier on me. I do have a table saw, but it's a half an inch thick and you can see that it has kind of this ugly edging. So we're going to fix that right now. So I've never done this before, <laughs> but we're going to do it together. What we're going to do is we're going to put some edge banding on these shelves on the front and you can actually see that it's going to be too thick and so we're going to just iron this on and then i have a special trimmer that will trim it off when it's nice and cool it's been a long day I've been working on this piece for about 10 hours so far and it's not quite done. And it actually looks a little like a hot mess right now. I've got paint all over the glass. I intentionally did that because I know I can go back in and kind of just scrape it off with a blade. There might be just a couple of areas that I want to touch up tomorrow. So it's the next morning and I'm really happy with the finish of the hutch. What we're going to do is scrape it all clean get the edges cleaned up. We're going to, going to install the shelves. I'm excited with how it's turning out. Let's finish it up. To finish out our hutch, I attached all the hardware. Some of it's the original, some of it's the old. Since it was mixed and matched, it didn't all quite match exactly correct. So I took some gold leaf rub and buff and kind of touched up all of the hardware, especially where we had maybe gotten some paint on it. I ended up getting a little bit of gold leaf on the cabinet, which I touched up, painted that. So in the end, the china hutch took about three times as long as I thought it would. I'm constantly doing that. I'm miscalculating how long it's actually gonna take. But in the end, I absolutely am thrilled with how it looks. It really echoes the one of Ethan Allen without the hefty price tag. I have about $150 into this, all said paint, hardware, supplies, all of that, and I'm thrilled.
Now the inspiration one, I think it was actually made out of wood, but it kind of had like this metallic finish that made it look kind of like a brass tray. And it sells for about $44 at West Elm. And I thought, we could do this for a whole lot less. And so on one of my thrift trips, I found this gold tray that it was kind of a plastic gold tray, but it was already gold and it was about the right size, the right shape, it had the handles. It looked really, really close to the Inspiration one. Now the gold tray, like I said, it was kind of like a plastic one, but it was like a heavy plastic one. The finish was not in fantastic shape, but that was no matter because we were going to take it home and um, use some rub and buff on it. And that's what I did is I took three different colors of rub and buff. I believe I used antique gold, Grecian gold, and European gold. And I kind of layered them on one at a time. So I take one color, put that on, take the next, layer that on, and then the next and layer that on. And then if it was heavy in one spot, I would go back with the one color and kind of just give it this really cool kind of sponged on patina. And I use these little sea sponges for that. I went all the way around. And by the time you were done, you would never guess that this was plastic. It looks so beautiful. In fact, if I might be so bold, I like, personally, this tray better than the Inspiration one. I like the patina of it better. I think it looks a little bit nicer. The sponging effect that they did on the West Elm one is all very consistent. And if you like that, that's great. But I kind of like the variation and of my tray versus theirs. But again, it's a very similar look. I think it's a really good knockoff. Okay, so here's what I have planned for 2023. I'm gonna be doing a new series which is going to be called Who Made It Better? And it's going to need a little audience participation. So I'm really excited about that. And then we're going to do some new room makeovers. And of course, more of what you already love. I don't want to change things too much, but I like to keep things nice and fresh so that you don't get bored and stale. And then of course, I'm going to be making a big announcement in the next couple of months. So I'm very excited about it. It's something that I've been working on for over a year. And so I cannot wait to make this announcement. So if you want to know what that is, you're going to definitely want to subscribe so that you don't miss out on that. How I did this is I went outside and I cut a branch off of my dead tree right now. And it was one that I could spare. I pruned it. <laughs> and then I needed to put it in a base. And I already had this concrete pot from Ikea in my stash. I hadn't used it for a while. I like it. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to use it. I took some Dollar Tree floral foam, a couple of pieces of that, glued it into the base of the pot. And just to give it a little bit more stability, I tucked in all these empty grocery bags around the perimeter of it because they were two squares and I wanted it to, you know, give it some stability first and not have to use a ton of rocks, which is what I added after the fact. I took some Dollar Tree rocks and covered up the kind of ugly mechanics of the whole thing. Then all we're going to do here is we are using hydrangeas from Dollar Tree. These are the, a really pretty pink color. Um, they've really improved their flowers. And all we're going to do is pull off the petals all the way and take individual petals, kind of bunch them up, and then we're going to hot glue them in just random spots on the, our little tree here until it looks like a cherry tree. Now they do sell some cherry blossoms. I was able to find some, but not enough for the entire tree. And the TikTok video actually used these hydrangea petals. So let's get gluing them on. Nothing can break me. Ooh. I also did some where I put the glue on the petals and pinch that around the branch. That was actually a little bit safer for my fingers. <laughs> a little less burns that way, but I kind of rotated back and forth, kind of depending. I just kind of let my creativity go wild. It was super easy to do. There was a couple of spots where I felt like there were branches missing. So I broke off some smaller branches and glued that to the bigger branch and created this beautiful tree. When I got all of the blossoms on, how I liked it, then I took a hair dryer to kind of blow off a lot of the strings. It kind of makes it shrivel up or blow away. And then of course I went back in and plucked off all of those little I don't know, hairy cobweb-like 
things. When it was finished, I am telling you, this might be one of my most favorite Dollar Tree, Dollar 25 Tree. <laughs> <laughs> DIYs that I've ever done because it was really amazing to go from like a dead branch adding some petals on it it really does feel kind of like a cherry blossom tree I don't know they kind of remind me a little bit of sweet peas they are beautiful so I'm pretty sure that she got her pink roses from Hobby Lobby and that's where I got mine. I got five big bunches. Now three were of one kind and they ran out of her original kind, but I felt like I needed more. So I went and I got um, two additional ones that were really close. You can almost not tell the difference. And yeah, so we had like five big bunches. So it's like five dozen roses, pink really pretty but i start by pouring in the white rocks that she got from the dollar tree and i put that in first in our like globe vase which was also from hobby lobby and i poured in the white stone first very carefully and then i ended up getting some clear epoxy resin kits i had one on hand and then i bought an additional one i didn't know if i was going to need one or two so i just went ahead and i put in both parts to mix that up really really good make sure it's thoroughly mixed in it usually takes a couple of minutes and then I poured in the first one and then I mixed up the second kit and then I poured that in next and it kind of settled in over our white stones. Then I wanted to do the arrangement. It's really simple, really simple. If you're not a good floral arranger, this is going to be easy for you. I took some clear tape and created a grid because I knew with a kind of the wide globe that it was going to be really not wanting to stay into place. So I made it a crisscross grid and then I kind of shrunk it up a little bit around the edges by adding a little bit more clear tape. And then I just put the whole bunches in just like she did and stuck it into our epoxy resin. Now, ideally what I like to do is do the arrangement first and then lift it out and put it back in. But just because I needed to do the grid, it wasn't gonna work out. So I did have a little couple of bumps with the epoxy resin, which I wasn't thrilled about, but it is what it is. And then all I did was just kind of tweak where the roses sat and that's it super easy and it is beautiful oh my word is it pretty i love this diy now this one is kind of a little bit expensive to be honest with you i got everything on 50 percent off but it still added up i don't know where i ended up but i'm, I'm gonna guess that it's in the 50 to 60 plus dollar range but it, isn't it gorgeous and springy and fun i love it but what do you think This piece that I am going to attempt to DIY, I have seen trending all over Instagram and it's very expensive to get the whole thing. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of dollars and we are going to be doing it for pennies on the dollar. But for this one, we're gonna need to go outside and get powerful, but I don't want you to be scared because this is a perfect beginner DIY project, super easy. So the first thing we're gonna do is I went to the home improvement store and picked out this very rustic four by four. It even has some dings and nicks in it already, which is good because we're gonna distress it anyway. So it's already got a beginning start on it and it was pretty inexpensive. This I believe is six feet tall and it was around $8. We are gonna cut this in half so you could actually make two of what we're making. Make one for a friend and then make one for yourself. <laughs> and then, so that will make each one about $4-ish for this portion of the project. So all we're gonna do is use our miter saw to make one simple straight cut. You can totally do this, I promise. And let's just do it. We're gonna mark it to 36 inches and make a cut. I started right in the middle because I, I found center because everything was going to go off of that. I didn't want to start incorrectly. So we're going to start with center. Then we're going to take our carpenter square and make all of the marks. I think it's about an inch to an inch and a half, but we just use the carpenter square to measure it out. We want 
two on each end. We don't want to finish it with one. We want it to be a little beefier on the outside. So that means we need to start with two on the center and it will just go two, one, two, one, two, one, two, all the way down. And so to make that easier, we are going to mark it on one side over here. So we're going to just use this carpenter square to make all of the drill marks because we can just line it up. For all of our measurements, we either do exactly in the center or for the one where we have two, we measure that one inch from each side and then we just get all of our markings there. Then we are ready to drill. This is where a good quality drill comes into play because it really does make a difference. And then you take a wood boring bit. It's also called a spade. I used a three quarter inch spade and looking back a seven eight inch one would probably have worked a little bit better because I did end up having to take that and make the holes a little bit bigger in the end to make it work for what we are doing. And then we just started drilling all the way down. Drill, 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 and it went really, really quick. <laughs> a good drill will help with that. Then once we are done drilling, then I took my shop back and vacuumed up all of the drilled out wood pieces and cleaned it up a little bit. Now it's time to distress it. I really wanted it to have a rustic vibe, like I said, and the piece of wood that we already had, had that going on. In fact, one corner of it kind of had some live edge on it a little bit. And so I kind of wanted to mimic that on the other side. So I just took a chisel and chiseled down the other side and it was imperfect and that didn't matter at all because that's the look we were going for. And then I did that on both of the end pieces. And then I went about really distressing the whole thing, taking a hammer and banging it, taking a screw and hammering that into it and just making it look really rough and beat up and that was the look that we were going for and then once we had it all distressed like we wanted I took my sander to it just to kind of wear it down making sure that all of the corners were rounded down um, sanding it good enough that there's not any like slivers or harsh things that we could get a, an owie from an owie <laughs> yeah I must be a mom <laughs> Anyways, um, really wearing that down. Now, my original plan for this was to stain it or add some other element to it and seal it. But after looking at it, I really loved the look with it in its raw, unfinished state because it really had a, a kind of driftwood vibe and I loved it and I decided to leave it unfinished and raw. If you don't like this look, feel free to stain it, feel free to seal it, do whatever you want. But there was something really cool about it in this raw unfinished state. I think that that's something that we're seeing in some of the dough bowls and things like that. But if you have like a brand new fresh looking piece of lumber, I'd probably add some kind of stain or sealer or something to it. So then all you need to do is load it up with your candles. So I ordered my candles off of Amazon and it was a little bit more than Dollar Tree, but what it did for me is save me from going to Dollar Tree to Dollar Tree to find enough candles for my candle piece. To me, that was worth the little bit extra. And the cost of 48 candles was just $32 and you just load them up. Now, the ones that I've been seeing on Instagram were varying candle heights. This doesn't have that variation. That will cost you a little bit more money to get the variation in heights and you'll have to really seek these out. The candles that I used, I think were 10 inches tall. That's probably on the shorter end of what I would recommend you do. So if you can find some that are 12, 14, 16 in there and you can mix them up, you can do whatever color candles you want. You could switch it out by the season and it looks really, really cool. And this is such a cool thing that could work on your dining room table coming up for all of the festivities. And it, it has a lot of flexibility, a lot of possibilities. And in the end, our base only cost us 
$4 because the whole big piece was $8. So I've got enough to do a second one. And so $4 for the base. Hello, that is amazing. But wait, there's more with this DIY. I also bought these little test tubes off of Amazon. Now I didn't get enough for my entire length because I didn't know how many holes we'd have. So you're going to need to order some more of these if you like this idea. You shove these in the holes where you'd put the candles and you have a whole bunch of bud vases. This is something really cool that you could switch out and use fall stems or you could switch out and do Christmas stems or you can switch out and do spring stems. So many, so many options. Uh, this just gives you a whole another avenue to go down as far as decorating this. So you could use it as a candle base or you could use it as a test tube base and switch out the kind of stems that you put in those test tubes. And you have a really versatile, very high-end designer looking piece of decor with so many possibilities. I just love that. <laughs> but what do you think of this DIY? This is as beginner of DIY as it comes, but it really does make an impact. So I ordered a set of these airtight jars off of Amazon, but you can find them at Hobby Lobby. You can find them at Ikea. These kind of jars are readily available, but they are really good for storing your baking items with. Now I love labeling things. So what I did is I was going to originally design my own labels and offer those to you, but I came across one from a website, which I will link in my description box, that already provided a free printable and they were beautiful. And I'm like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I just went ahead and printed out her things. Now, what I'm printing it on is special paper. Now, the way she did it in her tutorial was a little bit different. And this way I feel like is a little bit easier. <laughs> and so I love that. So we are going to print it out on my new favorite find. Well, it's not really new. I've been using it for a little bit on my channel, but it might be new to you. Water slide paper. It's very affordable. You can get it off of Amazon and it is so much fun. So all you need to do is print out these free labels onto this water slide paper. Then you're going to take it outside and you're going to do triple thick crystal clear glaze. That is a tongue twister. <laughs> but this is the stuff that I highly recommend. You're gonna spray it on the paper and you're gonna do three coats every 15 minutes. So one coat, wait 15 minutes, one coat, 15 minutes, so on and so forth. And then you're gonna wanna make sure it is fully dry. Then all we're gonna do is take out a paper cutter and cut out these labels um, to the ones that you're going to use. I'm not going to use all of these labels, but you'll have them ready to go if you decide to add more jars to your collection. We are going to submerge the label in water for about 30 to 60 seconds. And you'll know when it's ready when it starts to separate from the backing and slide around. That's where the water slide effect comes in. Then you're going to place your label where you want it on the jar. And I would recommend making sure that all of the um, the little latches face in the same directions. If you're OCD, that will drive you crazy. <laughs> so even if you're not OCD, you would prefer it that way. And then you're going to place the label where you want and then gently slide out the backing and then make sure everything is smooth, dry it up a little bit, and then let that fully dry. And then you can fill it up with all of your baked goods from your sh brown sugars, white sugars, flowers, whatever you're wanting to put in these jars and put the labels on. And it looks so beautiful, right? And it was as simple as printing something out on your printer, spraying a couple of coats of a clear glaze, submerging it in water, putting it on, super easy project. And it has fantastic, beautiful, high-end results that I think you'll love. I, I love it. I love the way this looks. What do you think? So next up, we are gonna be making a recipe book stand. We are gonna be using some unconventional items. For this, we're also gonna get a little bit powerful, so meet me back outside. This is what I found at Hobby Lobby, and we want it to sit kind of on an angle. And so for the base, I decided to use <laughs> a deck spindle that I pick up 
from Lowe's. Um, you might have seen these on my channel a time or two. <laughs> so here's the two different sizes that I use most frequently. This one's a little bit smaller, a little bit skinnier, and this one's just a little bit beefier. This is the one that I think we're gonna go with. We are gonna cut it off right here, and then up here we are gonna put it on, I'm gonna try a 37 and a half degree angle on this part, and so we will make those two cuts, and it will be, Super easy. And as the light startled our eyes, we let go of discard. The next thing that I did was I laid our plaque face down on the table and then I added some wood glue and then I added a little bit of weight to hold it in place while it dried. I shot in a few finish nails from the front side. We also needed to add a base. We attached that to the center. We marked where center was. We added some wood glue and shot some finish nails from the underside of that and we let that fully dry. Now we needed something for our cookbook to sit up against and so it wouldn't slide off the plaque. So I used one of these wood slats that I got at the Dollar Tree. They have some great wood slats and wood plaques now in their wood section and this was the perfect um, depth and it was a little bit long so all we did is cut that down to size and then we nailed that into the bottom of the plaque and that will give us a little lip for our recipe book to sit on. And then we added some wood putty, let that dry, and then we sanded all of that out. And then I decided I did want to stain this one, so I took some Kona brown gel stain, which is a color that is very close to my kitchen cabinets and some other wood pieces that I have in this area. And I gave that really good coverage and we let that dry. And then once that was dry, I wanted to seal it, so I took a matte sealer and sprayed it on and let that fully dry. It would be beautiful just to display out on your kitchen countertop with a recipe book open to a fun recipe. I know that we're not to the holiday season yet, but I really think this would be a fantastic gift idea. So put that in your back pocket and save it for later or get started on it now because it is such a great look. Love it in my kitchen and I think anybody would love it in their kitchen. But what do you think? Next up, I set out to make a DIY paper towel holder. This is just a super simple project. This is a Dollar Tree toilet bowl plunger and it is gonna work perfectly for our paper towel holder. So all we need to do is get rid of the screws and cut this down shorter. I measured it, our paper towel holder is 11 inches so I want to cut it to about 11 and a half inches. That's right about there. So we'll make that quick cut. Later on, I, I went back in and cut off the top because I felt like it was a little bit rounded and it needed to be flat. And so I just sliced off a little bit off the top. So ultimately the, the, the toilet plunger stick should end up being about 11 and a quarter inches. Then we're gonna get a seven inch round. I picked this one up at Hobby Lobby. These are really easy to come by. You can get them at Walmart. You can get them at Michael's. You can get them pretty much anywhere. You need some sort of wood round. Then we're gonna drill out a hole in the bottom of our toilet plunger and then we're also going to drill a hole in the center of our wood round and then we are going to drive a screw through the bottom of the wood round and into the bottom of the toilet plunger. What we are going to do is I grabbed a little bag of finials at Hobby Lobby, had three finials in it for $1.50. It's such a good deal and we're going to use two of those. We're going to and put one of them on the bottom base and we're gonna put one on the top part of the toilet plunger. And we're gonna use a little bit of wood glue to hold those in permanently. And then if you can't physically push it down, um, you wanna might wanna check the size of the hole. If, if it's a good size, you want it to be nice and snug so you'll just take your hammer and tap that down into place and it will work out great. Then we are going to drill out a hole for a finial on the very edge of your wood round. It doesn't really matter because it's circular, so just pick a spot, get to the edge, and drill out a hole. So with that all assembled, 
Now we're going to spray paint it in a matte black spray paint. We're going to do at least two coats. You just want to make sure it has good coverage. Let that fully dry. Then we're going to use some Grecian Gold Rub and Buff and we are going to apply that with a small paintbrush and we're gonna get in all of the nooks and crannies on the two finials. So that gives us a really kind of high-end finished look with that gold accent and we're gonna let that fully dry and that is it. Now you're ready to put a paper towel roll onto this and use it. It just feels a little bit higher style and we have like $5 into it. It's super, super inexpensive but it definitely has a high-end feel. I love how this looks. Thank you so much. I hope you're enjoying what you are seeing so far. I do need to take a quick second to thank my amazing community for all of the love, the support, the well wishes and prayers. They were all so felt by me over these past couple of months that I've needed to take off for health issues. I still don't know what is the cause of my health issues, but the good news is, as I am on the mend, I made some lifestyle changes. I started drinking a ton more water, started eating a lot cleaner and added some supplements in and I'm feeling a lot better. So I will be back in the saddle, hopefully very soon, creating more content for you. And I just wanted to make sure that you know how loved and supported I felt and I am just so grateful for you so I love you and thank you so much we made this really amazing chess table it's outdoors it lifts up so you can hide all of the chess pieces underneath this and I thought it would be really cool to do like a part two of this DIY. So I removed our original chess table top and kind of centered it on top of the round. And it really kind of came to the edges of this tabletop round. And I traced it all around just so I knew that it was perfectly centered and nothing was gonna be off kilter. And then I decided, well, how are we gonna make this sit? Cause I'm not just gonna put the tabletop round on it. That would feel to me like it could easily be bumped off and, and not just be a quality piece. So my idea was to kind of wrap it in wood so that it was very sturdily, sturdily, is that a word? <laughs> it was on there good. Either way, I took some little strips of wood that I had cut off and they, I think they were about three quarter inch by one and a half inch. They were left over from another project and I kind of traced where I wanted them to be all the way around. And then I took them to my miter saw. I love my new miter saw. It's awesome. Uh, cut so smooth. It's nice. <laughs> and then I m proceeded to make those cuts. Now they were a little bit more than a 45 degree angle. You can probably get away with a 45 degree angle having done it now, but it was a little bit more than a 45 degree angle. So I just kind of pulled it out a little bit, lined it up with a line and made the cuts. <laughs> Probably not the best way to do it, but it worked for me. And then once I had made all four pieces, so all four sides of that underneath table, then I took some wood glue and some finish nails and nailed that to the underside of the table, leaving the chess table in place so that it, I knew that it would fit on there nice and snug. You want to be able to move it out, but you want it to be kind of nice and snug on that so it's not going anywhere and not being bumped around easily. If you weren't doing this portion, I would just refer you back to the original video where we made the chess table and all we did is took like a big wood round that I got at the craft store, the home improvement store, and I wood glued and attached that to the underside and you could forego that like wrap section it's really easy so it's kind of the same concept as before just sands the chess table so go back and watch that episode and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about so with our tabletop now sturdy and ready to go I proceeded to stain the entire thing in a briar smoke gel stain which is kind of like a, a warm gray tone and I really love gel stain because it's got such good coverage I tend to like um, like a little bit more opaque stain and a little less translucent not all the time but generally speaking I do tend to go with a gel stain 
because I, I just like it. <laughs> I don't know. And then I let the gel stain fully dry. But before we could leave it out, we needed to seal it. Now you could go with a, like a polyacrylic, but I really feel like the better way to go here was to use this Thompson's water sealer. I do have to forewarn you, it does take a little while to dry. And maybe that's just because I live in Florida and it's super humid and the humidity makes it dry slower. And they do say one coat is sufficient. Um, so I don't know about that. I did go back in and touch up a few spots, but I didn't want to overdo it. But you put on a waterproofing seal and then let that dry. And if you live in a drier climate, maybe it will dry faster for you. Do not skip that step in my opinion, because if you don't seal it very well, this type of like butcher block type of table is not going to hold up and stand the test of the weather elements. If you don't do that step, it could break apart over time. So with a tabletop done, I'm gonna ask you to hang on just a second with me before we do the reveal because there are some other working elements and we're gonna kind of cover them all before we do that reveal. So stick with me, we're gonna do a couple more DIYs and it will all make sense in the end. So hang on, <laughs> I promise I'm getting you the reveal. For our next DIY, we are going to upgrade some bistro chairs. I went into Hobby Lobby recently and saw these really cute chairs with a cool shape. Now, the colors were a little wild for like what I've got going on on my patio. One was a bright yellow and one was a red. That wasn't gonna work for me, but the shape and the size and all of that really worked and I liked it. The price was pretty good as well at $48.99. So I picked up two and brought them home. And the first thing we did is give them a good spray painting on the bottom, on the top in a flat black spray paint. And and you're gonna have to flip it over, put it in a lot of different angles and make sure that the, the whole thing is covered. I ended up using three cans of spray paint for the two chairs, so about a can and a half per chair to get it really well covered. And then with it fully dry, I put on the little caps back on the feet of the chair and it was looking good. Now, I thought it would be really cool to give it a wood seat that matched our wood top that we just created and it just so happened that the wood rounds that they sell at Hobby Lobby, that I don't know the exact size. I think it's 16 to 18 inches. I sat them down in the store while I was buying them and realized that that was a good fit. So I just took those wood rounds and stained them in that same Briar Smoke gel stain on the front and the back and let that fully dry. And then of course, we cannot skip the ceiling of these chairs as well. Um, so what I did is I sealed one side, let that dry, and then I flipped it over and sealed the other side and so that it was fully protected top and bottom. What I did, because the arms were kind of an interesting shape, it wasn't really fitting on my table well. So what I did is sat that wood right on top of where it needed to be and then I laid on the ground and then I kind of traced out where I wanted to attach that on the underside. And once I got that all traced out, I took it to my little work table and I stapled on about six zip ties that were already black and used a couple of them on each one. And then I put it back where it was supposed to go, kind of threaded through the zip ties so it would wrap around all of those little spots that I got. And then I put the zip tie through the little device and pull it really tight. And then it, it's a nice snug fit and it worked out really great. Then you cut off the excess and you would never know that these seats are attached with zip ties. It's gonna be great. It's gonna work out just fine for our purposes. And if we ever wanted to remove the wood for whatever reason down the road, that would be easy as well. So we're done with the chairs and you're probably like, show it to me, show it to me. But I'm gonna ask you to hang with me just a second longer because I have one more project that's gonna go in that little vignette and I wanna reveal it all at one time. So no reveal yet, just yet, hang on. <laughs> This 
next DIY is a really quick one, I promise. All I did is I found this urn and it kind of mimicked the base of our table and it kind of had some similar coloring. And I'm like, I really want to tie this all together. It was pretty as is. I'm going to just say that up front. So when I do what I do, you'll understand why I'm doing it. I could have left it alone, but I wanted to add in that black and really tie that whole look together. So what I did is I kind of taped it off um, protecting those little decorative arms and like around the base and then I mixed some black chalk paint with some baking soda because I really wanted it to have kind of like a, a little bit more rough texture and I mixed that all together and then I proceeded to like stipple it onto the pot so it would kind of increase that texture and not have any brush strokes but have like a, a stippled effect which I really liked in this case then I took a small paintbrush and gotten all the little nooks and crannies and finished that out and then of course course I did not want to forget the inside because I didn't know how much of that would be exposed when we planted up our pot and so I painted that out as well and let that fully dry and that's it it was a really quick makeover then I just threw some stones into the bottom of it to help with some of that drainage I got this really pretty kind of orangey colored plant I'm not even sure exactly what it's called at um, Walmart for very inexpensive I just thought it was like a nice little pop of color and that was it for that project and now it's time for the reveal that I promised. What do you think of this makeover? I absolutely love it. And I think all in all, I'm in this under $200. And I just love how this turned out. Understand, I'm making all the wrong. So for our next DIY, we are gonna be doing like a solar powered fountain planter thing. It is also super, super easy. Anyone can do this one. So the first thing I did is I got a similar black urn pedestal base to the other pedestal bases that I have on my front porch because this was also gonna go in front of my home. I put it in the corner of our like front pathway to our house. And then I took kind of another black planter and flipped it upside down and kind of tried to level it out. And the reason I did that is so we didn't have to fill up the entire thing with soil and make it really heavy, but also to create kind of a flat base for the next part. And then what I did is I added some herbs in this pot, some like oregano and thyme. And I thought that would be kind of a cute little herb garden. So with those planted up, I found this really cool big heavy duty plastic bowl from Ross. And it was thick and really good size and it had this really cool like modeling effect on it. And I thought, actually that could work really, really well. <laughs> and, and so I bought it and then I set that right on the un upside down portion of that one pot that we kind of tucked down in the soil. And then I put some river stones that I picked up at the Dollar Tree into the base of that to weight it down, but also add a really interesting element. And then I added our solar fountain feature. Now I found this one, it had really good reviews off of Amazon, but what I really loved about this one is that it lights up at night. So hang on with me for just a second because it's really cool. What you wanna do is you peel off the little top portion and you submerge it into the water as quickly as possible so it sucks that that water right in and it will start working. It works fantastic in the daytime really, really well. There's a lot of little different toppers that you can put on it. It also does have the straws that kind of keep it in center if you want. I didn't think it needed it. it. You know, it pretty much took up the entire area there. There's lots of little different toppers. So if you wanted it to just bubble up a little bit or if you want it to spray, you can pick out what top works best for you. And I loved it. And here's the other thing is when it's spraying all this water out the sides, I'm like, hey, it's watering the plants for me. It's letting me off the hook a little bit. Maybe it will stay alive. <laughs> and so I'm like, that's a benefit to me, but you could put whatever top you wanted on that and then it just works on its own and then during the day it kind of stores energy stores energy so at night it has this really cool effect where it lights up it changes color and it's just kind of like something fun in front of my house and I love how this turned out. I loved the original one, but this one is definitely an upgrade from that one. So it's awesome and I hope you loved it too. So 
I had this frame that I picked up on like the Hobby Lobby. Then I went and hit up my scrap pile to see what I could find. Ooh, that is super close. Okay, so I just need to cut off a little tiny bit, but it's the right thickness and everything, and all we need to do is trim just a touch. Then I cut down the piece of scrap wood. I didn't have to cut off much. It was just a couple quick cuts to make it fit. And then I got to painting the scrap wood in two coats of white chalk paint. I split the image down the middle in two, and I printed out two sheets of this water slide paper using the triple thick crystal clear glaze three coats. I, I think I even did four coats on this because it was going to be a serving tray and I just wanted to be extra sure. With that dry, I made sure the cuts were super straight with my Cricut like little paper cutter. We just repeated that same water slide method of submerging the paper into the water, waiting about 30 seconds. Because it was a little bit bigger, it might be up to a minute. And this is where kind of like the rubber meets the road. If you did it properly, it won't disintegrate. If you don't do that crystal clear coats, then like the paper kind of disintegrates into the water and it's just a total mess. So make sure you do that step. But we didn't have that problem this time around. We submerged our paper, laid it out where we wanted and like carefully removed the under backing. And then we did the second piece, making sure to match up the seams as close as possible so that it was almost like non-existent. And then pulled that sheet out. And then I was like, yes, I don't even care that there's a seam. This is looking good so far. And then I smoothed it all out, got rid of the air bubbles and let that dry really well for like an hour or two, just to make sure that like all the water is gone and dissolved. Then I knew that I'm gonna be attempting to use this for a serving tray. So I did like two or three coats of a matte clear finish, um, a non-yellowing, this Watco brand that I really love and I, made sure that it was really sealed well. And also it was kind of dual purpose because I was trying to hide as much of that seam as possible. But overall, I was like doing a happy dance at this point going, woohoo, this is looking good. <laughs> and so then all we needed to do was put it into that frame that we got from Hobby Lobby and, and around the edges, I just took my finish nailer and nailed that down into place because we did not want it going anywhere. You don't want to be holding a serving tray and have the bottom drop out. So it needed to be secure. Now you could stop at this point and just turn it into a beautiful piece of art. As you see here, I, I think this could be a really good technique for art. Or you could continue on like I did and I used some of these really cool like iron handles that I love to get from Hobby Lobby in a black and I just screwed those in on either side and then we have this beautiful serving tray and it's so cute and summery and fresh. You could use it indoors, you could use it outdoors. I just love it. I think it's beautiful. It's going to be a lot of fun, I promise. So I have a free printable for this. I'm going to give you two printouts. There's going to be the smaller one that I use in this segment, and then I've made one that's a little bit bigger because it didn't end up using the full size of the piece of plywood that I use. So there will be the two options depending on maybe the size of plywood that you have available to you. So I went over to the home improvement store and bought a four by four foot piece of three quarter inch plywood. I had my printout and I, you can fold it together, you can cut off the edges, but you're gonna piecemeal it all together. It does go in order. So once you have it all taped together, you're gonna wanna tape it down. There was about a three or four inch gap on the bottom of this paper and I left it there because I wanted it to be just a little bit beefier on the bottom. So I have a stack of graphite paper, but you could use one sheet and just keep moving it down but I, I just filled it all up with the graphite paper I had available because you can reuse it over and over. So I just covered the entire thing with graphite paper under our printable, and then you go about tracing the entire image on to your piece of plywood. And then once you've got it on, you peel it all off and keep that graphite paper for another project because it will totally be good. And then we took it outside. Now this next part is like, I don't know, it's like 
adult cutting <laughs> is what I'm gonna call it. So all you're gonna do is drill a series of pilot holes using a spade or a large drill bit. All you need is several in your piece of plywood to create holes that you can stick your jigsaw into. So all you need to do is jigsaw this way, that way, cut away all of the excess, and then you are left with this nativity scene. And isn't that fun? <laughs> and then we needed a way for it to stand up. And so I just did some 45 degree cuts. I think the pieces were about 18 inches long and I put some wood glue on them and nailed them into place on either side. And then you have a really cute nativity scene. Now here's where I kind of debated between painting it white, staining it, or painting it black. I didn't really know. Ultimately, I went with white because I thought outside it would look really good um, to pop off. And I'm so glad I did. <laughs> and then you have an amazing piece. Now you could use this indoors if you wanted to, but the idea of this for me was to put it outdoors at night. You can use like a spotlight to light it and it would look really really, really beautiful. I just think this is really awesome. And for a, like a two by four and a piece of plywood, you have an amazing piece of decor that would have pro probably cost you, you know, $150 to $200, but you did it for pennies on the dollar and it's really special. So I hope you enjoyed that one. Well, if you enjoyed this episode, here's another one that I think you'll like as well. And to all of my DIY Niners, I just want to remind you that you are more powerful than you know. We'll see you next time. Bye.